Hi, I'm Dustin with ProAV School. In this video, I'm going to show you some system requirements when you're working with a remote Crestron programmer. As a Crestron service provider, I work with a lot of different installation technicians in different companies, and I remotely program systems where I'm not present. I put this video together as part of a course for people that aren't programmers, but that are loading code. The first thing is signal flow drawings. Signal flow drawing will tell you how everything is connected and will help you figure out how you're supposed to make things work essentially. It's the preferred way of getting all the information that you need and it eliminates a lot of the guesswork. I found when I do projects that don't have the signal flow drawing or it's not done very well, I have to go back and forth as a programmer changing things because the installation doesn't match what I had planned out. So having signal flow drawings obviously helps everybody. If you're not given a signal flow drawing, you need something to go by. So you need gonna need to know how the programmer connected everything in their code. You need to know how the video, what sequence the video inputs and outputs are hooked up in, where the audio is supposed to hook up, where the RS-232 control ports are, like which, which number they are, how the relays are set up, and if there's any I.O. ports or other stuff like that. In terms of networking information, if there is a plan, you want to use that instead of making your own up. I think it goes without saying that if somebody has planned out how they want the system to work or they have a an idea of the IP ranges and stuff like that, it might be for a reason, it might just be their own preference, but if somebody has given you this information, obviously you want to use it and not just make your own up. But if there is no plan, then that's where you have the ability to improvise. What I usually use, if it's just an isolated network, is the network address of 192.168.1 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. I don't use a gateway address because it doesn't need to get outside to another network. And I'll usually put the processor at .100 and the touch panel .101. And then if I have a DSP in the system, I'll do it as 102. And those numbers are just kind of a personal preference. There's no reason for using them that way. I just like to keep it in that range. Usually I keep my laptop statically assigned to 1.88 so that I can talk to all the devices. And one note here is that you make sure that you document how you've got it set up. And if there's any usernames and passwords that are not the defaults, you should record those as well. Now IP table entries, it's it's a Crestron specific term. It's basically how the device talks to the processor or how the processor talks to external devices via IP. So it's not necessarily a port, it's more of an identifier. So IP IDs come in the range of 03 to FF and it's defined in the program by the programmer before it's compiled. So they should be able to give you a list of what the IP IDs should be. Most of the devices, like touch panels and DM switchers and stuff like that, will establish a connection from the device to the Crestron processor. So it's the touch panel that's going out and talking to the processor. So in that case, the device needs to know where the Crestron processor is, but the Crestron processor itself doesn't necessarily care where the device is. It just has an open connection waiting for somebody to connect and say what their IP ID is. So for example, if you have a touch panel and a processor, the touch panel would know the IP address of the processor. It would also have an IP ID assigned. So when the processor gets something connecting at that IP ID, it would know that it's supposed to be this specific touch panel in the programming and it would interface with it that way. So because of that, in most cases, you will need to set up the IP table entry on the device. When you load the code itself on the processor, the IP table for the processor side is loaded automatically. So you don't have to, you usually don't have to go in and set IP table entries on the processor itself. If you do, make sure you know what you're doing and why you're doing it because you can kind of screw things up and make it so things are not going to work properly if you try to manually do things on the processor side if the code is expecting it to be a different way. So in that case, all you would need to do is reload the code and it would refresh the IP table on the processor. 
So on the device, we'll show in our example that on a touch panel, you'll enter the IP ID and the address, or host name if you're using host names, of the processor. And I already alluded to this. The IP table on the processor is defined in the program in most cases. I would almost say in all cases, if you're not the programmer, you shouldn't have to set this yourself. Another big thing that comes into play is RS-232 baud rates. And you'll usually see this expressed as something like 9600N8 and 1. This actually means 9600 bits per second, no parity, 8 data bits, 1 stop bit. But you most likely never need to know what that actually means. Um, nobody really cares. It would just be 9600 N8 and 1 or just 9600. That's how it would be expressed. And I've seen, out of all the devices I've worked with, most of them are N8 and 1. It's only Sony that I've seen where it uses E8 and 1. So just a, just a rough note there for you. Some of the common baud rates, 9600, this is by far the most common. I've also seen a lot of 38, 400, and 19200. Some devices don't let you configure the baud rate, so it has to be a certain way. Um, other devices like projectors and monitors sometimes let you set different baud rates. So the programmer will configure in their program what baud rate it's supposed to be at. That's not something that you can typically change at runtime. And then the devices will have to match that. Now the files that you're going to need, we've talked about the files already. Now processor code is .lpz or .spz if it's an older processor. And also the SIG file for debugging purposes if the programmer needs you to do some debugging. We're not really going into too much about that, but I just wanted to note it here. Touch panel code that you'll be loading is .vtz. And if you aren't given these files, sometimes if you're working with a programmer that hasn't worked with a lot of remote people loading code, they might be tempted to give you the source code. And I don't like that as a programmer. I prefer to send the compiled code because it ensures that the program hasn't been changed or modified by accident or by the environment being different. Only dealing with compiled files, it is the most reliable way that you can lo be loading code as a non-programmer. And that's what I would suggest is that if somebody sends you SMW, like the simple Windows file, and says, oh, you just have to compile it, you should say, look, I'm not really a programmer. I don't really want to mess with that. It's not that I can't do it. I just don't want to change anything on it on you. I don't want my environment to be different. I want, don't want to have to match the Crestron database version and stuff like that. So I would prefer if you compile it and send me the compiled files. And that will make things a lot smoother. That way, if changes are needed to be made, you can relay that information back to the programmer. They can make their changes in the master source code, send you the compiled changes, you load it, but they always have, as a programmer, they always have the latest version. Because I've seen things before where programmer sends the uncompiled files, the guy on site makes a few little tweaks that are needed to be made, but they make them and it works, but then that source code never gets back to the programmer. And so six months down the road, you go to make a change, but it's not based on the latest code. And that's a problem that we're tr gonna try to avoid. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it and got some good insight from it. Please like the video here on YouTube and subscribe for notifications when new videos are released. And I'd love to hear what you think about it in the comments. We'll see you in the next video.